seen it. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Joshua chapter 24. You know, when you're preaching on worship, it's nice when the worship is awesome. Our worship's always awesome. Amen? Alright, yeah, we need you to get in that. But it is awesome. Uh, when you feel his presence and you can tell he is in the place. Oh, so we talk about a camp. We actually have some stuff uh, going on for camp after services today. And whenever you get to go to camp uh, with the teams, woo, woo, uh, you know, whenever you get to go, you get to experience again. Like when you really focus on God, he doesn't show up, right? I mean, he's already there. He's in all places at all times. We use that language like it's cool when God shows up. And what we really mean is we've shown up. Like, we've gotten into it, our hearts are in the right place, our minds are focused on Him, we're letting other stuff go, and we're really digging into Him. Every year at camp, the team's going to do that for a whole week, right? And I think it's cool when we get to do that in the church service, when you can just tell the people that are in the room with you are here because of God. And uh, there's an excitement, there's something that joins us together. Also, I just want to compliment you on showing up. Because when I gave an announcement earlier today, there were like five people here, and now the place is like full, so thank you for, um, you know, being late, but still coming, and being here, not being like, oh, they'll see me late. No, we won't. We'll be like, yeah, you showed up, so, uh. We're going to be in Joshua chapter 24, and we're going to be talking on another one of our foundations. We've been going through the foundations of our church uh, in this series, and we've covered found people, find people, saved people, serve people, and growing people change. These are things that we believe are core values in Scripture, that God wants you uh, to be evangelistic, and God wants you to be full of ministry, and, and God wants you to be big on discipleship and growing. And so uh, worship is the one that we signify with this idea that you cannot outgive God. And I just got to, I got to bear my heart a little bit before I preach because I grew up, uh, as some of you did, and I think it connects us together uh, in, in our day and age. I grew up in a stricter church and uh, I heard often preaching on giving and politics. You, you remember that? Those of you that were in that kind of a church, like it was regular to, to teach about it. And those are things that are important that God's invested in. God wants Christians to be Christians about all subjects. But the thing is, is that you always have new people in your church. I mean, if your church is doing what it ought to be, you have visitors, you have people who haven't come, you have people who don't know the Lord as their Savior. And they have this idea that what church is after is your wallet. And then if you've ever attended a church that is after your wallet, you'll be like 10 times more sensitive to it, right? And so what I want to be careful to do is that I never want to get to the place that I don't teach the whole counsel of God. Amen? But I also never want to get to the place that I don't teach it correctly, the way it's meant. And, and God says, like if you want to sum up giving in the New Testament, the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. So the giving that we do ought to be cheerful. And it ought not be focused just on what you get at church. We are to be generous in all areas of our life. And you cannot outgive God in any area of your life that you're giving to God. So we talk about worship. We're not just talking about a dollar that you put in an offering plate or songs that you sing in church. Worship is literally anything and everything that overwhelms you by God's goodness or God's greatness. If, if something in your life overwhelms you at God's goodness or at God's greatness, you will begin to worship Him. Right? So think about the, the moments that people like to talk about. Like if you uh, have had the privilege of having a child, that is a worshipful moment. I mean, I promise you, you will, you will be overwhelmed that God allows you to have some role in another human being coming into this world. And that, that moment of birth and seeing your baby and being able to hold your baby, for me, I'm worshiping God. I wasn't singing. I wasn't putting money in an offering plate. I wasn't reading my Bible. I was just thanking Him. For, for the one. The other two, not so much. But, you know, for the one, God, this one is beautiful and pretty. No, I'm just kidding. You know, obviously, you know, there's these moments that are like, wow. Okay, so I, I know that I sound like a Chick-fil-A addict when I say this right after comparing having a baby, but when you have that chicken sandwich and you take that bite with just the right amount of crunch to like not breaded, you know, like a pork loin thing, I mean, and you go, oh God, thank you for taste buds and Christian chicken. When, when that moment happens, I know, I know. And Dina has to live with me, so pray for her, always. 
Look, in that moment, I believe with all my heart, you are worshiping God. Now, you can just eat that food and enjoy it for yourself. You don't have to pray before or after. God's not going to curse it and poison it if you don't. But when you take time to thank God for something that He is overwhelming you of either His goodness or His greatness, that is what worship is. And so when God saves us, the primary thing He is after are worshipers. We're going to do that forever in heaven. You realize that? You won't be able to evangelize in heaven. Who's up there that isn't going to be saved, right? You're not going to be able to give to the starving, to the poor, to the powerless. You can't do that. Everyone up there is going to be good to go. But you'll be able to worship with all of them. You'll be able to, to, to glorify God in everything you do. And this then begins to transform heaven. Like, that's the big deal to me. So, like, if you love canoeing in this world, I love canoeing. And if you get into canoeing, you just like the sound of a paddle in the water. And you like, like, going under a tree. And you like when there's some rapids and when it's calm. And you like baking in the sun all day. Like, if you enjoy that because God created it to be enjoyed, you are worshiping Him when you canoe. Now, if you go with your wife and you canoe and she doesn't know how to steer the boat, well, let's be honest, in our day and age, ladies, you go with your husband and he doesn't know how to steer the boat, and you just spend the whole time frustrated at each other, guess what you didn't do? Every moment, literally every moment is a moment that can become worship in our lives. Everything that we do. And that's why you read verses that will say, like, whatsoever you do, do it wholeheartedly as unto God. Well, the people that understood this the most in the Old Testament were these, these men that God chose to be leaders of his nation. And they got a different view of God, an up-close and personal view. We have a better view, according to Scripture, than they did. Because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us that can tell us that every moment is a worshipful moment. They didn't have that, but they were visited by angels, by God himself, and speak to them in visions and dreams, and he called them to be leaders. And in Joshua 24, we see the end of one of the greatest leaders Israel ever had. Joshua is the guy that leads them around the walls of Jericho. And God says, no, 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 I'm not just going to do this easy. You're going to walk around the walls and they'll just fall over, right? He's the guy that saw the Jordan River part. Think of the Mississippi River. Think of a river that big, and it just party. And you crossing on dry ground. Probably never forget that, would you? That, that's who Joshua is. And he comes to these people, and I, I want to read a longer portion of Scripture, so just please stick in it with me. I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. Let me just say this too. So I grew up on the King James Version. The King James Version of the Bible is a word-for-word -word translation, and, and, and I believe God preserved His Word in the King James. So I believe when I read the King James, I am reading the Word of God. But I do not believe that's the only book that God is working through or that He's preserved it through. So for me, I trust that at a higher level because I've read and studied it at a higher level. The NLT and versions like it are thought-for-thought -thought translations. So what it means is instead of trying to get every word perfect, they wanted to capture the thought and make it easy to understand the thought. So especially in texts like this, it becomes easier to understand. And for me personally, I just read it along the King James and make sure that they line up. And so if you're one of those who was raised King James only, you're worried about other versions, man, dive into them. Because God is speaking through more than just one version of the Bible. And if you're one of those coming in and you're like, I can't stand the King James. Cool, we're good with you. Love the Bible, read the Word of God, and that's why sometimes I put it in other versions. So let's not let that thing divide us in God. All right, amen, thanks. I could feel you amening that with me, and I, I'm so thankful you did that. So, verse 1 of Joshua 24. Then Joshua summoned all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, including their elders, leaders, judges, and officers. So they came and presented themselves to God. Joshua said to the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. But I took your ancestor Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him into the land of Canaan. I gave him many descendants through his son Isaac. To Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau, I gave the mountains of Seir. While Jacob and his children went down into Egypt, then I sent Moses and Aaron. I brought terrible plagues on Egypt, and afterward I brought you out as free people. But when your ancestors arrived at the Red Sea, the Egyptians chased after you with chariots and charioteers. 
When your ancestors cried out to the Lord, I put darkness between you and the Egyptians. I brought the sea crashing down on the Egyptians, drowning them. With your very own eyes, you saw what I did. And then you lived in the wilderness for many years. Finally, I brought you into the land of the Amorites on the east side of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I destroyed them before you. I gave you victory over them, and you took possession of their land. Now, what I want you to notice is whenever you're speaking or writing, and the word I appears a lot, you're not where God wants you to be. If you're speaking and you're writing and it's I, 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 your focus is wrong because it's on yourself. The being that it's right for them to say I is God because it is about God, right? So he's not coming in and, and letting Moses speak and Moses is saying, I did all these incredible things or Abraham is saying, I did all of these incredible things. All of the focus of Joshua's speech is, look what God has done. God is telling you, I have done all these incredible things. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that at the end of this leader, Joshua's life, God gathers all of Israel together to say, I did this and I did that. Verse 10. Oh, sorry, verse 9. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, started a war against Israel. He summoned Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you, but I would not listen to him. Instead, I made Balaam bless you, and so I rescued you from Balaam. When you crossed the Jordan River and came to Jericho, the men of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites and the, per and the yeah, Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Michiganites, the Jebusites. <laughs> sorry, is that not in yours? That's not in yours. All right, so I must have the, the, the appended bridge. But I gave you victory over them. But I gave you victory over them. And I sent terror ahead of you. Now, this is one of those cool places about the translation. So the NLT gets this capturing thought for thought. doesn't like to put something in there that we might not understand. The word translated terror here means hornet. So if you have a different version, it'll say, I sent the hornet before you. You know what's cool about that? God rescued Israel from one of the wars they fought by sending hornets into the enemy's camp. I mean, can we just be honest? If a thousand hornets were let loose in this building right now, what would happen? First of all, you'd be fine. You would just see them attack me because every bug loves me more than it loves you. I just promise that's the way it is. But when they were done with me, you better get out of here, right? But God is just, he is good with impossible. Like that's easy for him. Oh, here's an army that you can't beat. I'll just send bugs in. I mean, that's, that's who God is. That's how amazing he is. So it says here, terror, and that's not a bad translation. I would have been terrified if that would happen. I sent the terror ahead of you to drive out the two kings of the Amorites. It was not your swords or bows that brought you victory. It was not your swords or bows that brought you victory. I gave you land you had not worked on, and I gave you towns you did not build. The towns were where you are now living, I gave you. I gave you vineyards and olive groves for food, though you did not plant them. So before we read, we're going to read on to verse 24 look here in a little bit. Um, but when we remember well, we worship well. And one of my best friends uh, who came and preached at the marriage conference, Tim McKenzie, he's made this a part of their DNA at, at the church he pastors. That when you remember well, you worship well. And a lot of times in life, what, what ends up happening is we'll read a passage of scripture like this and everything God did was in the past. But don't you believe that he did all of this? Like, I believe that he parted the sea, and I believe that he sent hornets to win battles. And I believe they walked around the walls of Jericho, and they just fell down by themselves. I believe all the fantastical of God's word, because God is fantastical. There isn't anything that he cannot do. Like, people that struggle with creation, did he speak everything into existence, or did he help evolution along? He didn't have to help evolution along. He could just speak and everything be. He's all-powerful. Try to argue that with someone. Well, but why did he do this? Because he's God and he can well, what was like forever ago? I don't know. He's God and He knows. I don't know. Well, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to make sense to you. You're a smaller being than God. It is possible that He's a little smarter than you. That He knows things a little bit better than you know. And that His ways are more right than your ways. And His thoughts are more right than your thoughts. And so when you sit in a position of life where you're facing some impossible difficulties... 
or some impossible challenges. Or maybe God has asked you, called you to do something, and that calling feels impossible to you. But that's okay. Because you serve a God who is really good at impossible. He's great at impossible. And what happens is, is we, we get into that place, like we, we come to where all I see in front of me is that fight I have to fight, that walled city that I can't possibly defeat, that river that is way too thick for me to cross. We're stuck in those moments, and we stop worshiping. And that's the real tragedy of that moment. It, it isn't so much that like we stop believing or we stop doing, you know, but, but who we are as worshipers, the first thing God is after is not what you do, it's who you are. It's who you become in Him. And when we stop worshiping, we stop doing that. Like if you come to church because you had to come to church and not because it was a joy to get in here and hear God's Word and sing songs and be with other believers, look, I get it, that's happened to me and I'm a pastor. So, so I get it when that happens, but you are then not what God wants you to be. You can't go home and say, well, at least I did it. Well, yeah, that's better than not doing it. But what God wanted was a worshiper. He wanted you to come and, and get your worship on. He wanted you to come and recognize how great he is. And when you're struggling because he's not doing great in your life right now today, that's okay. That is the way it is. It is not all mountaintop experiences. If it has been all mountaintop experiences for you and your Christianity right now, can I just prepare you? It will not stay that way. Life is not a mountaintop experience. And God gives us abundant life. So Mark Lowry says, if this is life, abundant life is this. Right? You ever felt that when you become a Christian? The highs are higher, but the lows are worse, you know? It's just one of those things that when, when we can focus in on this big picture that God wants worshipers, and everyone who's overwhelmed by the goodness and the greatness of God is worshiping Him, but I don't have something present in my life to be overwhelmed by, so what do I do? Remember well. Remember what He has already done. You know, the, the interesting thing about the Christian walk is we tend to face the same challenges over and over and over again. And God solves them over and over and over again. And we face the new challenge and we're just as tore up as we were the very first time. Well, the first time I was college and I just needed $100 to get by this thing. And then it was a little later in life and I just needed $200. And, and now I'm an adult and I feel like I need $10,000. How can God do that? It is no more difficult for Him to do that than to give you a hundred. It's no more difficult for Him to cure cancer than it is to help you with a headache. God is never limited. The Bible says nothing is difficult for Him. Nothing. What, what happens is, is that when we don't worship well, God becomes small. And when we worship well, God becomes really big. And He becomes bigger than all the challenges and all the struggles and all the problems. And it becomes, you know what? God can do it. And I return to being a worshiper. And it's amazing what happens to the people around you when you do that. You guys remember um, Top Gun? I hear they're making a sequel. That just feels like a mistake. But um, you remember Top Gun? So do you, okay, if you didn't see it, there's this scene where two of the guys who are pilots are, uh, are at a place that you would meet other people. And, uh, and one of them's like, hey, I'm going to go meet that girl over there and get her number. And the other one's like, no way, you'll never do that. He goes, oh yeah, oh yeah. And so they agree on some sort of a bet. And then he turns that phrase on. He's like, she's lost. That love and feeling. And the other guy's terrified. He's no, she, I hate when she does that. And they go and they sing that song. Remember it? You've lost that love and feeling. Let's do that idea. Oh, yeah, that love and feeling. You know, as worshipers, you're going to lose that love and feeling with God. Everyone, everyone experiences that. Every believer except Jesus Christ. It's weird to call him a believer. But, but every human other than Jesus Christ has experienced that. If when you lose that feeling, you'll remember well, you'll get it back. It isn't about going forward. Worshiping now is what lets you move forward. Worshiping now is empowered by remembering well. What happens is you get this future hope. This idea that, that God's grace is going to be there for me in the future. Because it's already there? No, it really usually isn't until you do it. Right? Until it needs to be, it always isn't. But that remembering well is what gets you there. Is what gets you there. 
So the next thought, uh, let's read verse 14. The Bible says this, So fear the Lord. This is the conclusion that uh, Joshua begins to bring the people after he reminds them of all that God did. So fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. I mean, if you've read this, that the King James, like we put it in our houses, we memorize it. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What a great thing to stick somewhere in your house. What a great thing to tattoo on your I'm just kidding. How awesome to put that in front of you all of the time. We are making a solid, a clear, a, a declarative. We are going to say it and mean it that we are going to serve the Lord. Verse 16, the people replied, we would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods. <laughs> uh -huh. For the Lord our God is the one who rescued us and our ancestors from slavery in the land of Egypt. He performed mighty miracles before our very eyes. As we traveled through the wilderness among our enemies, he preserved us. It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites, the other nations living here in the land. So we too will serve the Lord, for he alone is God. And Joshua's not buying it. And Joshua warned the people, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy and jealous God. He will not forgive you your rebellion and your sins. If you abandon the Lord and serve other gods, he will turn against you and destroy you, even though he has been so good to you. But the people answered Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Joshua says, you are witnesses to your own decision. You have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, they replied, we are witnesses to what we have said. All right, Joshua said, destroy the idols among you and turn your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said, we will serve the Lord our God and we will obey him alone. So, so what happens is he says you have to remember well. And then he says you gotta get, you got to get rid of the stuff that's going to keep you from remembering well. you got to get rid of those idols. They're all pumped. We'll serve the Lord and we'll do it. You ever done that in church? I will be nicer to the people around me. And then you go watch all the movies that make you mad and make you want to go be mean to people. You know what I'm saying? Like, like You're like, yes, my whole life will be to God. And then someone asks you to do something for me and you're like, oh, I'm way too busy. I can't help you out. Right? Like it's, it's this idea that like then they have legit idols. Like they had little figurines and things they would make and stuff they'd have in their house and they'd pray to the gods of the Amorites who were supposed to be fertility gods so let's pray to them so maybe we'll have babies and maybe we'll have vineyards that grow real well and all of our ducks will have more ducks and all of our goats will have more goats and the Amorite gods seem good at that because when we came into the land of the Amorites their land was beautiful and glorious like that so maybe those gods know how to do that our God led us through the desert and enslaved us in Egypt so maybe we'll fear him because he can work those miracles. And they wanted to worship both, right? But remember well to worship well, cast out well to worship well. This is where it gets really dicey because there isn't a list. Like I can't give you your list. You can try to invent a list and give it to others, but it'll fall short. Only the word of God and the Holy Spirit can tell you what you need to cast out of your life. And you just simply need to be humble and obedient and obey. Well, I know this Christian, and they listen to secular music. Worry about you, not them. Nowhere in Scripture will you find that it is your job to be the Holy Spirit in someone else's life. But you'll find over and over again that it is your job to pray for them, and that when you're a friend and you're close and you know that you can get in there and love them with the truth, then speak the truth in love. But nowhere is it meant that we're supposed to be going around pointing fingers to everybody else because we should be too busy figuring that out in our lives. God, what do you want to be different? Do I need to give something up? If I need to give it up, then let me open my hand for it. We sit around with this, this fist. And, and if you know what I'm talking about, there may be something in your life that you're looking at and you're going, not that. I will love God and worship God with the rest of my life, but not, not that. I need that. And let's be honest, I want that. So that for me was basketball when I was growing up. Basketball turned to be from a pudgy kid to a skinny kid. 
it turned me into a popular person instead of an unpopular kid that people dogged. It gave me self-confidence. Made me feel good when I bust threes in people's eyes. I have basketball right here. Church Wednesday night? No way. Basketball Wednesday night. Because basketball is going on Wednesday night. That's what I'm doing Wednesday night. March, I disappear. I'm either playing basketball, trying to do what I saw in March Madness, or watching March Madness. Right? And everything. I'm shooting 500 shots a day. You know how much time I gave to basketball? I didn't give that kind of time to God. And I felt a time in my life that basketball, which is not an evil thing, I was holding on to it so tightly. I was going where I wanted to go because that's where basketball was leaving me. And God wanted me to do this and cast it out. Not forever. I have, I have been so privileged to be able to use my passion towards my purpose. And I've led people to Christ because I met them playing basketball. But at a time in my life, it was an idol. And I knew it. The only way I knew it is the Holy Spirit. I just, I never had any peace about it. I stopped smiling about it. I wouldn't have wanted to talk to any other person about it. There wasn't, it got to where there wasn't anything in it that I could praise God for because it was all about me. Now the idols that Joshua was talking about were real ones. They were physical. You could see them. And they were praying to them and they were worshiping them and then they were trying to worship God. Let's cover our bases. Our idols are different, Right? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing everybody here doesn't have like a little something in their home, a little incense thing that you've built up and you're worshiping a god of the Amorite. Right? Christians don't tend to do that. But there's a lot of things that can become an idol. Work, lust, money, uh, how people think of you, like your ego. You don't know you have it, but you know, your ego, your phone, food, I mean, entertainment. There's so many things that, that like if you think about how we're living in that area, we can't thank God for it. When I go to a golf course, which I haven't been able to do because of my feet, but when God frees me and allows me to do that again, and I stand in tee box number one, you fellas better get amen and agree with me that are golfers. I'm just saying. And you look out at that green, and you think to yourself, for four hours, no one is allowed to bother me. I can't get calls. I can't get texts. My phone is off. It is me and the, the trees that are off to the side of the fairway. That's where I'm going to live. And in the mud and the sandboxes of life, I'm going to experience this entire golf course. You know guys are worshiping when they go here and here and here and here and here and the green is right there and then they get there. Why not play the whole course? You people that are scratch golfers, you poor people, how, how dare you just walk down the center of the fairway. Boring, bent grass, it's mowed perfectly. No, seriously, when, when I go to golf, I think about the blessing God has given to allow that to happen. And I promise if you enter into that, when you shake your drive, you won't cuss. Because God allowed you to be out there. It's not about you showing what great golfer you are. It's about you being able to play a game that God has given you the freedom for. I like to show up to a movie 30 minutes early. I have conditioned my whole family that they like that. <laughs> they do. I promise you. Ask them. They love it. You know why? Because it's extra time that you are just free. It's a margin in your life. If you go and you're just sitting there and you have 30 minutes to hang out with your family and throw popcorn at them and, and talk and carry on until the movie starts. We have games we play. How many previews? And everybody guesses which preview will show. Whatever's first you win. What do you win? You just get to do this and no one else is allowed to do that. It's really all you win. And, and we, have, we have actually infected other families with it. Like we'll go with them and at first they're like, I don't know if I'm going to play. And then they, oh, all right, fine. And they win. And they're doing this, and the next time they're like, hey, what's your pick? Right? Because they, they won. But the point is, is that you can go, and you can go to a movie you shouldn't see, and it could be some evil thing, glorifying Satan with some horror stuff or whatever, and there's no way you could leave and thank God for it. Or you might go, and it might be Pikachu, and it might be a detective, and it might be funny, and I haven't seen that one, but maybe it's something you leave, and you're smiling, your family is smiling, and you say, God, thank you for this time. That becomes worship. So I can't tell you what to cast out. I just know that if you will cast out well, you will worship well. Because remembering well will get you there, and if you don't cast it out, it will take you away from it. 
that thing that is just a dream in your life, you've, you've got to be willing to let it go. To, to open your hand and let it go. And if you'll be willing to, then the stuff God will start to do in your life, it'll just be new. It'll be different. It'll be what God wanted it to be. Look, you've got to remember well, you've got to cast out well, and you have to pour out well. So verse 24 makes it clear that if they obey God, God is going to greatly bless them. And, and this is where we got to dive deep. I know it's 1050, but it doesn't feel like that, does it? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Three of you that said no, I appreciate that very much. <laughs> so tithing. You say pour out well, what are you talking about pouring out well? Most people go to money, and thank God that is not, that is not the only thing you can pour out. But can we just talk about it for a second? Because I do want to teach you the truth. So God, from the beginning, wants the first part. He just wants to be first. It's part of how we worship Him. And God, I have a whole bunch of stuff in my life, but you are first. You are always going to be first. And so with Cain and Abel, he asks them for an offering. Right in the beginning, they start taking care of stuff, and he wants, he wants the first. And then Abraham comes to the scene, and God actually puts a percentage to it. And through Abraham, he shows us he wants the first 10%. The first 10%. We call it a tithe. So God establishes that with Abraham before the law. Then Moses comes along and establishes the law. And the law begins to bring rules. You ever been told that if you don't tithe, you'll have a hole in your pocket and your money will fall out? God will curse you if you're not tithing? It's not true. It's not true. He did treat Israel that way. He did treat Israel that way. Just like right here, if they don't obey, he will curse them. Can I tell you, as a child of God, He doesn't curse you when you don't obey. All the curse was paid for by Jesus. All the wrath was satisfied. He is able to just always love you. That doesn't mean everything's good for you. It doesn't mean you won't reap what you sow. But when you see somebody struggling in life who's a believer, and you see some junk in their life, how dare you think God is cursing them? If he had to curse them because of their junk, he'd have to curse you because of yours. Well, mine's hidden. Nobody knows about mine. Wrong. God does. And so be really careful with the attitudes you form about the things God has set up to be for us. And we turn them around and we make it from people. So can I be honest with you? I have seen before the numbers here at the church and who gives. I haven't looked for a couple years or at least a year. So I don't know currently, but I've looked before. It doesn't affect me. If you give or you don't give, it's not going to affect my relationship with you. I won't love you more or love you less. I won't listen to you more just because you're a giver. That's not God. That's not who He is. So it's not who I'm going to be. And so when we talk about a tithe and we talk about what God wants, God wants you to trust Him with the tithe. And He says in a whole bunch of places that if you trust Him with the tithe, He will pour back out unto you. So you cannot outgive God. And there's a lot of people in this room, we could bring them up here and they could give you the testimony of when they did the tithe and then they started giving 10% of the stuff that God did in their life and it was just incredible and it was awesome. Not everybody has that exact story, but I promise you that you cannot outgive God. But the question then becomes, well, what if I'm not tithing? Does that mean that if I just tip, if I just give some money, God doesn't like that? He's hateful of me? No, He wants cheerful givers. And he wants you to grow to the place in every area of your life that you can fully be his. But can I just say this? Jesus said there is one main competitor between you and God for your heart. He says it in Matthew 6, 24. He says you have to serve one master. You have to choose one master. You can't serve two. You'll hate one and love the other or despise the one and cling to the other. You have to choose one master, one thing that is first in your life. And then he literally says, you cannot serve God and money. He, he just flat out says it. Jesus teaches more about finances than he does heaven and hell combined. And just be honest, because he knows us. Right? I, I bet there's not a person in this room that wouldn't like to win the lottery. I don't care what house you live, what car you have, you'd like more. So we went through this phase, and I don't know if it was the girls, I'm sure it was my girls, where reality TV just always seemed to be on the TV. So I walked into a room where it was on, and there was no one in there. And I knew if there was anyone else in there, I'd lose my man card, but no one else was there. So I sat, and I watched it, and they were throwing a birthday party for this little kid. And they like to hire a carnival to come for this five-year-old. 
And so, um, all they need is a box and a stick, y'all. Just give them a box and a stick. They'll be totally happy. Either girl or boy, it doesn't matter. They'll love it. And so, um, this lady says, we spent $50,000 on the party. And then she says, I know it's not a lot, but our boat hasn't come in yet. When our boat comes in, we'll do even more. So you don't make what she spent on that birthday party. And she's looking for her boat to come in. Money makes wings and flies away, according to Proverbs. You cannot live your money. You cannot live your life for money and be happy. You can't live your life for money. You can chase it. You can chase it your whole life. You cannot live your life for money and be happy. Because God has not put inside of the heart of the believer to be all about money. God has put inside of the heart of the believer to be all about God. Yeah. Be all about God. So wait, so if I'm not tithing, I'm not all about God. I didn't say that, and the Bible doesn't say that. It's just a, it's a, it's a marker. It is something set up. Because we don't like to hear that. We say, well, no, that's it. Jesus talked about tithing in Matthew 18. Abraham does it before the law. Jesus talks about it when he's not going to be setting up the law. And he says you should do it. There's no way around it. The Bible says that we should give a tenth. But the Bible does not say that God's going to curse you if you don't. And I promise you, our church and our church leaders will not judge you or think differently about you. And we don't look at those numbers. Like every month, we don't sit down and look at them. We are not after your checkbook or your wallet or your bank account. I mean, can I just, this is really hard for me to say. The truth is, is God is. He is if that's between you and his heart. If, if he's speaking to you and you say no, then that keeps you from being a worshiper. And to not teach that would be to fail the calling God's given me. But the nerves in me of hurting people, knowing that even in our area, people have been hurt because of money in churches. And that breaks my heart. The church is going to hurt people, but it should just always be unintentional. It should just always be an accident. I don't think that me or my wife or legacy or our leaders or the way we, I don't think we can escape hurting people because hurt people hurt people, right? But but it shouldn't be intentional. And so I just want you to know so you can tell other people if they come and they're like, hey, they asked for a special offering. This church seems like they're all about money. We're not. And God is not. He's not broke. He doesn't need our money to do what he wants to do in the world. Manna last year was given almost $8 million. And they gave about 91 cents of every dollar away to feed kids all over the world. And there are people that gave a whole bunch of money to Manna to make that happen. But if they don't this year, guess what won't happen? Man, won't suffer. They are taking care of the poor and the powerless. And God promises when you take care of the poor and the powerless, He will not let you become poor and powerless. There are people in this church with large incomes and big financial needs who choose to sacrifice and give 10% to our church. How in the world could we get four or $500,000 a year given to our church unless people are doing that? And it can't be easy. It's not always easy. When I write my tithe check, I don't always have every other need covered. But I, I want to tell God, hey, I, I love that you've given me what you've given me. Every good gift I have is because of you. When I see my, my kid in some awesome uh, you know, prom dress, God, you gave me that money. When I go on vacation, God, you gave me that money. I can, I can do this because of you. When I get in the car and I drive to church, I have a car because God has given me that. Everything you own is just something you're managing for Him. And when that becomes a part of your life, things begin to change. And maybe not today. Maybe God isn't telling you, hey, tomorrow I want you to make up for the entire 10% you haven't given in your life. Let's go to the bank and get the biggest thing in loan you can give, right? That is not what it is. What it is is God saying, just make sure I have your heart. And if you have some other reason and, and it isn't about your heart and God isn't yet there, look, you shouldn't leave here feeling guilty today about anything. You should leave here today feeling pumped up that I can literally worship God in any moment. I'm a geek about trees. I talk about trees all the time. I will park on the side of the road and stare at a tree. I know what you're thinking, okay? But he put it in my heart to be fascinated by what's happening there. What God has done to make it and to have it do the branches, and to have it do the twigs, and to have it do the leaves, and the way it looks when it's blowing in the wind, the way it sounds, all of that God. When the leaves change colors, God made that that way. The way it looks
looks in the winter when it's just barren, God made it that way. Everything about it to me says, God, you're just so much more complicated than I can get. And I'm sorry I geek out about it. Well, I'm not sorry about it. I worship God for trees. You may have never done that in your life. That's okay. What do you geek out about? I love food. Love food for God. I love to sit in a recliner. Have you ever thanked God for giving someone the wisdom to build a recliner? <laughs> that they learned a simple handle right here that I can pull out. This is the perfect position for a person at rest, right? Do you thank Him for your pillow when you go to sleep? Do you thank Him for the rainy day because maybe it represents peace and you can take a great nap this afternoon? What do you geek out about? You literally are supposed to be worshiping God for everything all the time. Like, all the time. Can you imagine who you would be to other people if you made that choice? If you, if you remembered well, and you cast out well, and you pour out well. If you do those three things, because Joshua lays the gauntlet down here. He says to these people, all the officers, all the important people, and the people themselves, and he says, choose today. Choose today who you're going to serve. Don't, don't just drift in life. Make a choice. And if you're going to make a choice to worship God, like if today is the day and God is talking to you and you are saying, okay, God, I'm giving it. Worship isn't a song. It isn't being at church. Worship is a 24-7, I am created to be a worshiper. Okay, I get it. So, so show me how I can remember well and worship for you for great things in the past so I can worship you right now. That's where I would challenge you to start. If you will start doing that, if you'll remember well, if you'll bring the other stuff to your life when he's ready to bring it, if you get used to saying yes, then it won't be hard to do this. It won't, it won't be hard to release it because you're already saying yes to God. If you start pointing at your wallet, it just won't be hard. I don't know why I'm supposed to treat this person out to lunch. I don't even know them. They are behind me. I had a number of legacies tell me this week they paid for two people behind them. I was like, wow, that's more than I've ever done. Like, I wanted to be in that one person camp, so I've done the one person. But I was just like, wow, so, you, so there's two people. And if it was a Chick-fil-A, it would be even better, because everything's just better. And it's just that's the way it works, right? I mean, I just, I was like, that's a great, awesome. That's pouring out. But if you'll remember well, you'll figure out how to cast out well. And then God will show you how to pour out well. And your, your life will be different. Because you cannot outgive God. But the best life is spending and trying to outgive God. Not so you can get into heaven. That's all about Jesus. Not so that you can matter to God. Again, see Jesus. You already matter. And if you know Christ as your Savior, you're in. You're not gaining God's favor. You're making God smile. You can do that. Just stand your feet. Let's pray.